Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by for my Sunday morning chat, although it's going to end up being a Sunday afternoon chat by the time you see it, that's for sure. Um, I thought I'd have a chat about the Catlia Alliance, a sort of brain dump, I suppose you could call it. Um, there's been a hell of a lot of renaming going on, but I mean, traditionally you've got Epidendrums, I mean, Cyclias, Lalias, Sophronites, Brassavola, and of course Catlias themselves, but there are quite a lot more in, in the Alliance, you know, and some of them, seems the more obscure they are, the more difficult to pronounce they are, but I mean, some of the other ones you might not have come across, Barkera, Anyway, there's loads. Uh, look it up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they all have similarities, but in amongst them there are some considerable differences. And I suppose the first real difference is, um, are they bifoliate, naturally, or unifoliate? In other words, do they have two leaves at the top of the pseudobulbs, or one? But with all the uh, hybridisation processes, you'll get a bifoliate that every now and again will only produce one leaf and sometimes it might produce three yeah so um, there are variables um, as far as size is concerned there are some true miniatures let's get this one down Ooh. that's the size of the pseudobulbs that, that's it the, the plant will form a clump basically and a spreading growth pattern that's, um, well it was, Sophronitis cernua. Um, I believe that's now classified as a Cattleya. And some, uh, some of what were Cattleyas are now called some entirely different. But um, they all have similarities. Now this one is different simply because one, it's a miniature. And two, this is a real warm grower. This can be found near the coast, you know, in hot countries. So, um, you know, Temperature ranges for Cattleyas can also vary. Vary. Some of the Lalias are classed as cooler growers and don't like to get too hot. And that's probably because they come from higher up the mountainsides where it's cooler. Whereas this one, although it's found inland, it can be found quite near the coast where it's pretty warm. But therein lies the, uh, the variable probably. Near the coast it will probably be a lot more humid to go with that heat. Yeah. Um, this one's having a bit of a sulk at the moment, uh, no idea why, but doesn't seem to have put up many new growths, if any, recently. It did do quite a mass blooming a while ago, first time ever. Prior to that I'd had an odd bloom now and again, but um, it did push out quite a lot all at once. Um, which would have drained the plant a bit, I suppose. <coughs> so I'm just dramatic. <laughs> desperately scanning to see if there are any new growth showing. I can't see any at the moment. Um, but anyway, from you know that size, possibly even smaller in some cases, up to what I would call a large Cattleya, and that is by far the largest I've seen. I've seen Cattleyas with pseudobulbs over a metre tall. Yeah. So um, prior to getting one for your little windowsill, it might pay to find out how big it grows, because some of them are whoppers, they really are. Great big long strapping leaves on top of quite tall, tall sturdy pseudo bulbs. So a variety of sizes of plant. Um, in the main they have one thing in common. They like a wet dry cycle. And um, you need to bear that in mind when you're thinking about what you're going to pot them in or on. Quite a lot of the Cattleyas do very well mounted. but. Um, Mounting something this size would have its problems, like trying to get it to stay on the mount, for instance. <laughs> Especially initially, you know, you've got to strap it on in such a way that it's nice and solid and the roots can get a hold. This is a heavy plant. There's a lot of weight there to try and strap on. Um, anyway, uh, sizes. <coughs> Colours, infinitely variable from pure whites. Um, you know, right through to the deepest of purples, brilliant reds, lovely yellows, greens. Yeah, it's all in there. The colours are there, you know. So you can start off at white and head off through the pinks, you know, in, into the purples. You can head off from white into the yellows and through the oranges into the reds, into some very deep reds as well. And there are even some that are a bit classed 
as blue, although I've never seen a true blue in a Cattleya. More like magentas are the popular colours and um, you do get some sort of um, lilac -y type purples and um, you know other sort of shades but I've never seen true blue in the Cattleya range. Um, fragrances, many are highly fragrant especially in the Brassavola area. Um, some are night scented, again Brassavola types, night scented, probably pollinated by moths or certainly night flying insects anyway. But um, many have got beautiful fragrances and some have none. Yeah, so again, you know, if you're, if, if you're, with me, what attracts me on a Cattleya Bloom is the shape, the colour, and the combinations of colours. And there are some combinations on Cattleya Blooms I just don't like. I don't like a yellow Cattleya with a red lip. But give me a red Cattleya with some yellow on the lip and I'll love it. You know, everybody has their own tastes. I love the big blousy magenta types with the yellow gold in the lip, often with a frilly lip as well. Those are smashing. Um, they almost typify the Cattleya blooms. They are often called corsage um, orchids on the grounds that the blooms are often separated off and put in a little box for Mother's Day and stuff like that. You just buy a bloom, something like that. <clears throat> So anyway, looking after Cattleyas, I think the most important thing really is that almost across the board, they like good light. If you want blooms, you're going to need good light. Yeah? The definition of good light is many, <laughs> many and varied. Um, some Cattleyas can be grown with some direct sun, but I wouldn't recommend you take one out of your... Um, lounge on the dining room table or something like that and put it straight out in the sun it will burn yeah despite having great big thick leathery fleshy leaves they'll still burn and i have some burnt leaves to prove it just too close to the glass when the shade netting was off yeah and it's the sudden change that will do them in you know if you're going to change the light levels with cattleyas do it very gradually you know, increase the light over quite a period of time. Don't take them from low light to sunlight. They won't have it, they'll burn. <laughs> and once a cattleya leaf burns, that's it. You've got to live with it for a long time or cut it off because cattleya leaves can last many, many years, unlike some other types. <clears throat> um, growing seedling cattleyas. Um, I don't see any problem with this, apart from the time it takes. It's not something I do, but I was given some, so I have got some seedlings growing on. I mean, this one had hardly any roots when it started out, but it's now got some roots. Um, when you get what appears to be a seedling or a young plant, unless you can find direct information about it, um, I mean, this is actually a Cattleya cross, <coughs> um, crossed with an Encyclia species. Well, I can look up that Encyclia species and see its, you know, estimated blooming size, but then if you cross it with a miniature Cattleya, which Little Lemon Drops possibly is, you don't know what its overall size is going to be. Once you start combining stuff, you could say, well, it'll be somewhere in between. Well, sometimes one of them's really dominant and it'll grow to the size of that one. And maybe the other one just imparts some of its colour from the blooms or perhaps its fragrance, which might be why it was included. But um, the difference with seedlings, from my point of view, is the wet-dry cycle doesn't need to be as extreme. Yeah, I wouldn't let them stay dry for any length of time simply because they haven't got the strength in them yet. And the size of the pseudo bulbs doesn't hold much, so they haven't got so much backup as a you know large specimen mature plant with you know one foot long pseudo bulbs. But growing seedlings is a good way to get a good Cattleya collection if you've got the patience. There's another little one coming on. Um, again, not much of a root system when I got it, but it's done the root, so you know now it needs to do new growths and possibly get larger but again if you don't know how big it's supposed to get 
If that is a miniature, the next pseudo bulb could even bloom. Who knows? Oh, that's got a name that takes too long to say. I'll be here all day. Um, yeah, so uh, all sorts of sizes, not really all sorts of shapes. The fundamental Catlia shape will be a base with relatively short rhizomes, pushing up pseudo bulbs with leaves at the top. That, that's its basic form. How long the pseudo bulbs are depends on the species or what went into the hybrid, and they can be very long. They can be thick and chunky. Where's it gone? So I'll have to dig now. <laughs> Lack of planning, Roger. <laughs> they can be long and spindly, like this one. This one, oh, that blooms, looks like it's opening. Not open, but opening. Oh, that'd be good. Probably tomorrow or the next day. Um, I mean, this is a strange one. This has had problems in its life. Um, this one is a little bit of a crawler. Um, it crawls at quite a rate across a pot on the grounds that the nodes between the pseudo bulbs are quite long on that one. <clears throat> and that combined with long spindly pseudo bulbs, you know, can lead to a straggly plant. Yeah. Whereas the one behind it, that grows bolt upright with very short nodes between the rhizomes. So that stays as quite a compact plant, and because it sticks bolt upright, it doesn't take up a lot of space. It, it uses height rather than width, whereas this one's all over the blinking place. Um, but that's their basic shape. As far as where they come from, <laughs> it is said that once upon a time there was a huge landmass, and that was it. And um, it broke up and drifted around the globe to form the continents as we know them now. And the Catlias went west, and the Dendrobiums went east. So you, you're not going to find Catlia species growing naturally in the Far East and you won't find dendrobiums growing naturally in the Americas. And down through the middle, the Africa and the Madagascars of the world, a whole different set of orchids. Well, that's a theory, obviously, but um, it holds true in the main. Catlias are mainly found in the Americas. Um, there are some in the north, the other side of the thin bit in the middle, but most are found in the thin bit or in the, in the bit below, excuse my geography. <laughs> you know, there's the big bit at the top, <laughs> and then there's a the thin bit, and then there's the big bit at the bottom, and a lot are found in that big bit at the bottom, the likes of Brazil and places like that. <clears throat> and some of them can be found at quite high elevations, and if there's an element of that in your cross, it won't like too much heat. Now, generally speaking, above 32 degrees, most Catlias are not too happy. And Catlias, in the main, have a lovely mechanism in that type of orchid. If they start getting too warm, and especially if they're a bit, a short, bit short on the old hydration from the roots coming up through the plant, they shut their leaves down, they close up to conserve moisture, which is a clever little adaptation for possibly the environments they can come from. Um, but the idea with Catlias is that when you water them, water them well, add whatever feed you're going to add. I mean, Catlias pushing up new pseudo bulbs are going to use a fair old bit of energy, quite honestly. You know, to take this from start up to there, including the other one the other side, um, takes a fair bit of energy. But they are lucky in as much as they've got backup energy in the older pseudo bulbs. Yeah? So if they are a bit short on the old uh, grub stakes, they'll nick what they can from the older parts of the plants. But as we know, there are nutrients that are immobile, so they, they land wherever they're going to go in the plant and they're stuck there. plant can't move them around. Um, so, you know, they're going to need some feed to get up there. I know people who feed Catlias when they've got actively growing pseudo bulbs at levels I would never dream of putting into an orchid, but they do, and theirs grow, well, theirs grow well. So when in full growth mode, they can take a fair bit of feed. 
Um, I would suggest, like all orchids, they need a reasonable balance feed, you know, with um, decent amounts of um, N and K. The old P in the middle, it's been deemed, doesn't need to be as high as once thought. Um, so, but certainly, you know, if they're in serious growth mode, they're going to stonk the old nitrogen, they're going to hit that hard. Um, however, once cattleyas mature their bulbs, if they're blooming size, they're likely to bloom in the not too distant future. That uses a lot of energy too, but it uses different types of um, energy. Nonetheless, if your fertilizer's got all the stuff in there, it'll probably be okay. Tro chopping and changing the fertilizers, some say is a good idea and others don't bother. It's a choice, it's up to you, it depends how you feel. And, and what you've got and whether you can be bothered I suppose so uh, mm. um, yeah minimum temperatures for cattleyas most of them are not too happy if they get down below about 12 degrees they can go lower for short spaces of time but months on end probably wouldn't do them any good and the one thing that's probably going to happen in lower temperatures is they will slow right down if not stop yeah so if you've got pseudo bulbs pushing on as you get into your winter time, they may not grow as well as they might have done if they pushed on through the spring and into the summer when the heat's there and the longer days are there. It seems that with cattleyas, any, any bulbs that mature into the winter are liable to be a bit smaller and if the plant subsequently blooms during those short days and cooler periods, um, you may not get as many blooms. Um, they may also be a slightly different colour to perhaps the same plant that blooms in the spring or summer. So the, you know, the temperatures and the um, light levels and day lengths can have an effect on bloom colour. Um, some people say different types of fertiliser will have an effect on the colour. That's possible. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, for me, I, I once had quite a vast collection of cattleyas. Um, I probably had more cattleyas than anything else once upon a time, till the dendrobiums took over my world. But I lost a lot because I suppose you could probably say about 90% of the cattleyas I had came from one place, a private seller on eBay. Lovely lady down in Devon and had cattleyas for sale on eBay all the time and some smashing looking plants. Unfortunately, across the board, every single one had fusarium. And in those days, I didn't know. I'd never heard of it, let alone not know the symptoms or what to do about it. But they all, slowly but surely, some quicker than others, went downhill, seemed to slow up roots seemed to start failing and I didn't know why. I thought it was the way I was looking after them and my environment was wrong. In other words, I blamed myself for quite a long time. But I kept trying, I kept getting more in, often from the same place. And I had some beauties in there. Um, I'll put some pictures up as, as I progress from here onwards of some of the ones that were in, in that set, ones that I've lost that came from that supplier. There were some beauties in there. Um, nowadays, I know the symptoms, can spot them a mile off, and if there is any doubt whatsoever, they get treated. They get a systemic fungicide with as much as I can get on the roots to get it in the base of the plant, which is where it seems to reside with cattleyas. Yeah, but because cattleyas have rhizomes and grow outwards from a central point, they are capable of growing away from it and becoming clean. So it can be cured in cattleyas if you catch it soon enough. If it's established well in the plant, it will inhibit all the pathways through the lower part of the plant and the roots. It will fail to hydrate properly, fail to take in nourishments and just slowly die. Some, well, again, sometimes quicker than, quicker than others. Some can live with that for years before they go down. And what normally happens is one that's undisturbed can last quite a while with Fusarium. And then you repot it and it kicks it into life because you've disturbed your roots and everything and put the plant under stress. At that point, they can go downhill a lot quicker. But um, 
If you can get a good systemic fungicide into the base of the plant and multiple treatments as recommended and all that sort of stuff, if it's got enough strength in it and room to move, it can push out new growths, which from that point on can be clean. Yeah. In other words, you've stopped it spreading um, and killed it off, basically. Unfortunately, with Fusarium, you can never get rid of the damage that's done. So, you know, the base of the plant that's all bunged up with the spores cannot be cured. It will always be all bunged up. So you have to get new growths which can produce new roots which will then grow properly with active green tips. Um, something else Cattleyas are prone to um, is something called, what the hell is it called? Edema or edema or edema, however you want to pronounce it, something like that. It's basically blisters on the leaves and um, although it's not a disease or a, a, a type of rot or a fungus or anything, um, once you get these blisters on the leaves, um, they, c they can become infected, yeah? So although, like I say, it's not, it's not a fungus or bacterial rot or a disease, it's a problem. And effectively, it, it's, it's a treatment problem. It's what is being done to the plant. And bottom line is, there's too much water in the plant and it can't get rid of it. So it causes cell rupture on the surface of the leaves, which forms blisters. Um, causes are, uh, well, quite spread out really, but fundamentally, um, <clears throat> in like very warm, bright light conditions, a plant will take on board, providing it's provided with it, a hell of a lot of moisture at the base of the plant. And the transpiration that goes on in those sort of conditions will push that moisture up through the plant and out through the leaves. That's perfectly normal. But the thing that stops that happening is a plant that's bursting with liquids because like, you know, it was a good day, good growing conditions, plenty of water supplied to the plant, and then it gets very cool overnight. Yeah? And at that point, that process stops and all that water's stuck there. It can't get out. Um, <clears throat> also, a plant's absolutely bursting with moisture inside the plant and the temperature gets too high, at which point the plant shuts down. All the little holes in the leaves close up to try and conserve moisture. Yeah? Well, then again, if it goes into the night time at that point, um, too much moisture in the leaves. That's, that's all it is, really. Um, what else? Um, watering late in the day when you're expecting quite cool temperatures overnight. That's not the best of ideas, yeah? You're better off, if, you've, if you're starting to get cooler nights, then water as early in the day as you can um, and allow the process to take place during the time that the temperatures are pretty good and the light's good. Um, that way the plant's got rid of any excess by the time it goes into the night and the cooler temperatures. Um, and basically, if you've got continuously cooler temperatures with cattleyas, like winter time perhaps, and shorter days, they don't need as much water. The wet-dry cycle is better off extended during those sort of periods. In other words, more dry than wet. Yeah? But when you've got good temperatures and longer days, and the nighttime temperatures don't drop down too much, the wet-dry cycle um, needs to be there but they don't need to stay dry too long or you will start getting a bit of desiccation on the canes um, and they don't look as good but they naturally do do that um, it's not very often you'll see a mature specimen plant where some of the older pseudo bulbs haven't developed the creases on them yeah I mean, most of the older bulbs on my cattleyas are not mine, because a lot of them I haven't had that long, because I had to replace a lot where I lost so many. But they always seem to start off nice and plump, and then as they age, they start to get a few creases on them, some more than others, and some hardly at all. <clears throat> so what else can affect cattleyas? Um, with very high temperatures and also very high humidity, they are prone to the soft rots, the black rot and the brown rots, 
and they can take over a plant incredibly fast. They can start up near where the leaf leaves join, the base of the leaves. They can start on the rhizomes, base of the pseudobulbs. But with quite high temperatures and very high humidity, uh, you've effectively created an environment where bacterial and fungal rots, specifically bacteria, can, can breed like hell and get a hold and destroy a plant. Um, Cattleyas don't really need incredibly high humidity. Um, I mean, that's, that's why they can be grown in the home. You know, they would prefer probably about 60 to 70 percent. That's not high. Um, they can go down to 50 percent and still be perfectly happy, maybe even lower. I don't know. I don't ever get humidity lower than that, so I don't know. Mine don't seem to do bad in what they get. Um, yeah, so uh, that's humidity. Temperatures, I would suggest a high of 30 is good. A bit higher than that, perhaps, if the humidity is good. Too much higher than that, and a lot of them will close down for that period. They'll get going again when the temperatures drop off a bit. And winter minimums, I wouldn't go much lower than 12, I must admit. Um, although some can be found at cooler temperatures than that during winter months. But um, you, you, that really is down at sort of species level. And with hybrids, um, just go in the middle somewhere is the easy way, quite honestly. You know, somewhere between 15 and 28 is good. What they do like is a distinct drop between daytime and nighttime. That is quite important. Without that, you will often find you've got some non-bloomers. They do like that distinct difference between daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures. You also have to bear in mind where the majority of the cattleyas come from. They'd be classed as tropical from the tropics. And as such, they get pretty consistent day lengths. The old 11 to 13 hours type thing. So like in the UK, when we're getting down to blinking seven hours in the winter, they're just not going to grow much. They're just going to slow right down. So, uh, yeah. What else, Catlias? Oh, right. When they do decide to bloom, we have quite a variety of stuff going on here. We have... I've got one here. Classic example. Double sheath. Pushes out a large sheath. And then inside it grows another one. And then from the base, the buds will push out. They've got to get out through two sheaths. Some people recommend snipping the top of the sheath. I don't do that if a sheath's green. It's designed to be there to protect those buds. Um, I think it serves a purpose. But you do on occasions get a sheath that dries out very fast and goes a brown colour. And if you feel it, it feels quite woody. And you can get buds that can get trapped in there. They just haven't got the strength to push out through that hardened sheath. Under normal circumstances, that sheath shouldn't do that. That's probably a drier atmosphere or something like that. But under normal circumstances, the sheath should stay green. But some cattleyas, they grow a sheath and that sheath appears to die. Yeah, well, don't give up because sometimes six months later, the buds will push out. Yeah. So that sheaths. Um, all cattleyas bloom from the top, from the apex. I don't know any that don't do that. They, they all push their blooms out from the top. There may be some that don't, but I don't know of any. Um, number of blooms on cattleyas, infinitely variable from quite huge clusters of blooms on a single pseudobulb to just one. Um, it's often the case that the really, really big cattleya blooms tend to be the ones with much lower numbers, just one or two per pseudobulb. Um, those that have the medium-sized blooms seem to have a lot more. Some of the miniatures I don't know that much about because I haven't got many. Um, the cernua that I showed earlier, that has a single bloom per bulb. I think it might actually have had two or even three. But in the main, it seemed to only produce one. But they can produce more. Um, you will also get some cattleyas don't even produce a sheath. The bloom spike and subsequent buds come straight out of the top of the pseudo bowl. No sheath at all. So quite a variety there as well. From no sheath 
to a single sheath, to a double sheath, um, to sheaths that stay green and the buds push out through, to some that dry off and the buds come later. Um, so, you know, quite a variety. Just because a sheath is formed doesn't mean buds are in, imminent. Sometimes they can be delayed a fair bit. Um, repotting. This is good fun. <laughs> Again, catliers play games in this arena. Boy, do they. This is where I would suggest keeping notes because it may save your cattleya an awful lot of stress and a possibly a recovery phase. Cattleyas produce new growths from the base, yeah? At some point, they will produce some new roots, but the point at which that happens is gonna vary qu quite a lot. Now, I've got some that grow a new pseudo bulb, it pushes on, it matures, and it blooms, and there's not a sign of any roots until after the blooms go. Then the roots start to grow. So if you repotted that when the new growth started and you lose some of your older roots, you've given the plant a hell of a setback because it's not going to get any new roots for quite a long time. So it's got to survive on what's left. Yeah? You get others that push out a new growth and the, the new roots start immediately. Well, good time to repot that one is with the new growths. But you need to know because there is quite a lot of variety there. Some of the pseudo bulbs get about halfway up before the leaves fully open and then the new roots come out. Yeah? So it, it does pay to keep notes to aid repotting. And there is no substitute for repotting a cattleya as the new roots start to grow. Some are more prone to root loss when you disturb them than others. This is maybe coincidence, but in my experience, the bifoliates are more prone to dropping older roots than the unifoliates. Now, that could be just coincidence. <laughs> you can't put that down as a rule. <laughs> it's a generalization. But I have found that the bifoliates are more susceptible to setback at repotting time. So for me, you know, it, it, I make it absolutely crucial with those types that they only get repotted when I see new roots. Unless the media is so bad that that's going to do more harm than good. But I haven't got any cattleyas in that state now because all the cattleyas I've got have been potted by me. There's nothing left lurking around in that category that's in somebody else's media for an unknown length of time. And the idea with the holy clay pots was to get them in there with very large chunky bark and it's orchiata bark which allegedly lasts a hell of a long time and it should last even longer because it's being used with a wet dry cycle. Mm. Right, bugs. Cattleyas are scale magnets. I think there's a company somewhere that's got coaches and they basically send out little people to do a survey and if they find somebody that's got a cattleya collection they organize coach loads of scale to come to that place and deposit them knowing that once a few get in there and get going the chances are they'll survive over a very long period of time boy are they a nuisance to get rid of Scale on some other types of orchids is not so difficult to get rid of, so you have to ask why cattleyas? And a lot of it is because if you use a systemic pesticide on a cattleya, these big, thick, fleshy things are quite reluctant to take on board what you've sprayed on the leaves. They're not going to take anything on board that runs down the pseudo bulbs, so the best way to get a systemic into a cattleya is get it in the roots and most of the scale on cattleyas will congregate around the base of the pseudo bulbs and in, into the tops of the roots and that part of the media. That's why they're quite difficult to get rid of because half of them you can't even see. Especially if you're working on a visual removal like the old Q-tip and the um, rubbing alcohol, well you can only do that on the ones you can see and I'll guarantee there's quite a lot you can't see. So you're not gonna get rid of them that way. You can only get rid of the ones you see and that's the same with any of the um, types of treatments that use the um, 
suffocation method you know the oils and um you know the baby oil mixed with water and stuff like that all these home remedies and stuff like that they work by suffocation well the only way that can work is that you suffocate everything that you've got you're gonna miss some <laughs> they'll be back uh, what else occasionally mealy bugs will have a go at cat leers, although the leaves are a bit flesh fleshy and leathery for mealy bugs to be able to get a bite on them but they'll have a go at your new growths when they're nice and soft um, but I would say scale are the worst things and you can get spider mites on cat leers. Um, Quite honestly, you can get spider mites on any type of orchid. Um, the idea is to create an environment where the spider mites just don't do so well and, you know, deal with them in a routine way. If you've ever had spider mites, unless you can guarantee you've got rid of them all and the subsequent eggs that have hatched, then again, they'll be back. Um, so that's Cattleyas. Um, for me, a very rewarding set of plants to grow. The number I've got now, I have no plans to increase, but I can easily be persuaded by a decent sized cattleya plant with a flipping good root system and a bloom that just catches my eye. So never say never. I've got enough, you know, bearing in mind most of my cattleyas have to live in a certain place and those places are getting a bit full. I could squeeze a few more in. And I could certainly get some more miniatures in. So never say never. The chances are there will be some new cattleyas now and again. But it will be based probably on being able to see the plant, pick it up, check the root system and know what the blooms are going to look like. And preferably fragrant too. Yeah. So uh, that's my take on cattleyas um, and the alliance and associations that they've got. Um, but, you know, important things with Catley is good light, um, check the temperature range of the species if it is one or, or its makeup if you can find that out to make sure it's a, either a warmer grower or a cooler grower and keep it in an associated place. Most of them like good light. I don't know any shady Catleyas. Um, and watch your repotting. You know, make, make sure you're going to, if you're going to disturb an old root system and possibly lose some of those roots, make sure the new ones are on their way. Um, apart from that, pretty easy going. They're tolerant of a variation of humidities, quite tolerant with temperature ranges. They're not very tolerant of low light, they just won't bloom. <laughs> but apart from that, they're pretty easy going. Um, and if looked after, can look like flipping good plants. You knock them about, any damage you do to leaves, I mean this, this is a bad one, uh, this is not me, these leaves were like this, they haven't got any worse, um, but to make this plant look better, I could just take that pseudo bulb off. It's, you know, the, the infection that it got did actually even get into the pseudo bulb, it stopped before it dropped down into the plant, otherwise I'd have taken it off. But um, yeah, so uh, that's Catleyas. Um, and by the time I get this posted, it will probably be middle of Sunday afternoon or maybe even Sunday evening. <laughs> anyway, see you next time. Uh, there's a, quite a lot of questions have occurred over quite a lot of period regard period of time regarding the Catleyas, and I hope I've covered them all. Um, if not, leave another one in the uh, comments. But, uh, see you next time. Bye for now.